we next have uh, Rachel Glenister. So we are uh, delighted to have her over here. So she's working on fumes and caffeine because she's just off her red-eye flight and we appreciate her being over here. She's chief economist at DFID and uh, extremely busy, but equally She's uh, one of the founding directors of JPAL at MIT and uh, has done lots of really important work on vaccines, deworming, and uh, randomized control trials. We're delighted to have her. Please. Great, thanks. Um, do you have slides? I do not have slides. I'm going to give you a break from PowerPoint. Um, Excellent. So I'm going to try and ask, uh, sort of, uh, as someone who's been on <clears throat> the research side and also on the policy side, <clears throat> I hope my voice doesn't give out, I'm going to try and ask, uh, ask and answer four questions. Um, one is what, and, and I'm going to, going to broaden things out <clears throat> a bit from this important work on, on you know, culture um, and historical uh, determinants of where we are, to sort of development economics in general and ask, uh, what has changed? What have we learned um, as a field? You know, where have we really moved the needle? Has that, as a research community, has that then fed through into changed development practice on the ground? Um, what are some of the urgent gaps for research to come and help fill, you know, from my perspective now within the policy community? And, um, and then a, a set of pleas at the end, as in my role as a policy person to the research community about how you do research and how you interact on policy. So um, let, me, let me attempt to go through all those. For, first, let me just say, like, if I think back to doing development economics as an undergraduate, I mean, the field has completely changed in many, many ways, right? First of all, there's just a lot more of it. Right, there were not that many people doing development economics. Uh, I hate to say how many, you know, 25 years ago. Um, there is, uh, there's more of it, it's more rigorous, it's more micro, and there's been a lot of angst about that, but we should recognize that one of the reasons <laughs> that it's more micro is we've been extremely successful in development policy and research in fixing the macro, right? I mean, when I was at college, we, half the development course was on how do you fix hyperinflation? We do not have half our papers about hyperinflation anymore because we don't have that much hyperinflation. We kind of know how to fix it, um, and we've sort of fixed it. So, so that's one you know, good news story that I think we sometimes underappreciate. So it's more micro. It's also more solutions-based. Um, and I'm going to come back to that because a running theme in what I'm going to say, which links back to the other talks, is culture and context are really important to think about when you're doing development work. But if you're going to think about policy implications, you do also have to think about what are the general lessons, what are the, what are the, the, you know, the general themes that come across, because that is what policymakers find useful. Because if you only say your research is only relevant to those you know, five villages where you did the research, nobody's, you know, you're, I would argue you're not really social scientists, because you know, it's all about being really context specific, but also clear about what are the general lessons that you're testing and what you think can generalize. So um, I feel like, so, so what have we learned? Well, I think there's some real leaps in understanding that, that we have uh, generated as a community. Um, I think one is a set around these sort of uh, you didn't like historical determinants, and I agree with you because I think it, you know, we, there is evidence that you can change these things, and historical determinants means, you know, suggests that these are unchangeable laws. But, you know, understanding what has driven some countries to be poor and others not, and, you know, you mentioned the slavery um, articles. I think over the last 10 years, we've got a lot more sophisticated in that discussion about how history has influenced where we currently are. It's not just, you know, 
you were invaded by the British <laughs> versus the French. Like it's a lot more nuanced. Uh, and I think we've made a lot of progress in that, in that uh, lessons. I think education is an area where I'm passionate about. I've just come back, if you've heard from DC, lots of conversations about how to bring into practice the lessons in education. It's been a huge number of studies on specific interventions in education, but that has led us to th think completely differently about education systems. Uh, and I'll come back to what I mean by that in a minute. Social protection, we've, we've learned a lot more about how to do social protection well. That's part of the reason why we're reducing poverty uh, around the world. Obviously, um, growth has also been important, but we've got real changes uh, in reductions of poverty from better social protection. And behavioral, behavioral economics, huge contribution from development economics to our understanding of the biases that people have, in particular, the behavioral biases that are generated from being poor. So the huge cognitive bandwidth tax that poor people face and that they find it harder to make long-term oriented decisions because they are hungry uh, and poor and worrying about uh, where the next meal is going to come from. And so we've learned a lot about that. So th those are areas where I feel we've really made leaps in our understanding. Now, has that translated into changes in policy? Um, I think, I think uh, there are a number of routes that's done that. One that people talk a lot about, but I think is actually the least important, but is nevertheless important, is sort of scale up of specific things that have been tested in research and then scaled up in the policy community. So, you know, conditional cash transfers, teaching at the right level, the graduation programs, these are all things that are now reaching millions of people who were originally tested uh, by, by, the, by the research community. So that's one route that you, you know, researchers can use to, to influence policy. But I'd argue it's the least important route. I think much more fundamental um, uh, are some of these others. One is defining the problem, right? Understanding what the problem is. So again, if I, if I think about education, the policy community is now talking about the learning crisis rather than getting kids in school. Right, that has a lot to do with some of the important descriptive work that, that researchers did about understanding you know, that there are a lot of kids in school and not learning. So it was sort of a bit of a side product. And this is a theme I'm going to come back to, that descriptive, important, careful descriptive work. And we've heard a lot about it. And the firm's work is a really good example of that. Just describing the problem. When we describe the landscape of firms in countries and the fact that management practices vary and that small firm, we have a lot of small firms, understanding that that, but they are not very productive, understanding that that's the problem is really important uh, in the policy uh, community to, to, for what we focus our energy on. Uh, so a good example of that is, you know, the microcredit. It wasn't just the uh, microcredit RCTs. It was combined with understanding that small firms didn't grow and small firms were very unproductive. Well, that it's the combination of the two that really, you know, changed the policy focus to saying, actually, getting more micro entrepreneurs is not really what we should be aiming to do. It's about productivity of large firms that we need to be worrying about. Um, so. Um, so that, that's kind of defining the problem is really important role. And then there is taking the it kind of individual studies and building up from those to a bigger policy conclusion. So let me give you an example of what I mean by that. So there are a whole set of studies looking at very specific questions about, you know, if, you know, if you give bed nets for free, do people use them? And this was the example that people used of, you know, micro studies being not very relevant and asking small questions. In fact, it was asking a really big question, which is, are people price sensitive? Do people not take up uh, really cost-effective preventative health just because of small changes in price? 
And people tested it in bed nets, and they tested it in chlorine, and they tested it in deworming, and, it, and they tested it in soap. And always you got the same answer, which is we as human beings are ridiculously price sensitive to preventative health and education and a lot of other things that we in the development policy community want to get people to do. And that understanding both you know, helped us understand behavioral economic biases, but it also more practically in policy terms meant we've got to be really careful when we think about pricing these goods. Right? And particularly preventative health, we now is, you know, across the world, is much, you know, much lower prices and often free. You're seeing a wave of countries adopt free, uh, free health care for preventative health. Um, and that, I think, comes from a lot of these individual studies. So education is another example where we've take, we, you can piece together a lot of the individual studies and you come up with a conclusion. I've just been presenting this as you know, our best buys in education that has come out of research. So one of them is we want to change education systems so they are not as elite focused as they have been. Right? So a lot of developing country education systems are based around exams that are left over from a colonial period and you know that 5% of the population will pass. In Sierra Leone, there was a year when zero people passed the final exam. Right? The entire curriculum, the textbooks, everything is designed around this exam that in one year, nobody in the entire country passed. Um, so, I mean, yes, they, they, it's more than zero now and, and you know, and Sierra Leone's get upset with me with giving that example, but, you know, across India it's the same thing, in Kenya it's the same thing, the percentages will vary, but it's focused on the elite. Now, that lesson came out, nobody did a randomized trial of, you know, the exams, but every single, if you draw, if you read all of those trials, you will see that the ones that succeeded in changing things were getting around the problem. They were all different ways to get around the problem that the curriculum was really different from where the children were. The descriptive data was important in that too. So it's this taking the careful micro studies and pulling out a more general policy conclusion, which is that is the thing that makes the biggest difference in policy. And that is one of the things I'm going to come back to of what I want you guys to be spending more time talking about. So um, third thing, where are the urgent gaps? So we've heard a lot about the really important work, including a lot of the work that has done, been done in cage and firms, but we need more work on firms. We've got some really fantastic descriptive work that has been really important um, in influencing policy, certainly within DFID, certainly within the World Bank. Um, but we still don't have, you know, when I'm asked by teams, what do we do on the ground? There's some great individual studies, but it doesn't, it's not a sufficient range of options that we really have a good set of tools to offer countries. <laughs> So, you know, a plea for more work on firms, in particular, not micro firms, but middle and, and large scale firms and productivity and management practices and all the stuff you've been talking about today. Yes, great, but kind of, can we have some more of that? Um, uh, because it's more kind of individual things at the moment than kind of a really large coherent body of evidence, which is what is so useful. Um, a regional plea, Africa, I mean, as I was going through the website uh, yesterday of all the policy, pa all the papers that have come out of this, and India is a fantastic place to get lots of evidence. Uh, it's got wonderful, you know, you can do all sorts of research because different states are doing it, different things. Um, but 80% of the extreme poor are going to be in fragile, in countries that are currently fragile and conflict affected uh, in the future. So we need to know more about how to fix poverty there. Uh, so that's not just in Africa, but, but, but fragile and conflict affected states, and there will be more of a focus of poverty within Africa. Um, and that's partly because of the success of India taking on a lot of the, <laughs> of the results that have come out from a lot of research. Climate is another area. So, 
Uh, you will have heard that you know, our current Secretary of State is, has the ambition to double the amount of money we spend on environment and climate at DFID, but it's not just us. I mean, we have people on the streets. This is a really urgent problem. And having reviewed the evidence in this area, boy, is it weak compared to this, the size of the problem. There's some really interesting, important work out there, but there's a lot of really bad evidence too. A lot of evidence that is based on engineering models that does not yet take into account how people check, how, when, pe when you do the policy, people respond to it. Guys, that's what economists do. That's what we're good at. Uh, and that is what the climate space is crying out for. Not, the, not just the engineering models, they're a great, great place to start, but how do people respond when you actually start introducing policies or start doing these? You know, people, uh, when they, you know, you insulate a house and it works brilliantly when nobody lives there, but when people live there, they open the windows and, um, uh, you know, they, they turn up the thermostat because their bills are lower. Like, people respond. We know that. We, when we don't understand enough about, how, uh, about what that means, the ultimate implications of some of these things are. Governance um, and political economy. It's the biggest constraint in what we can do in many developing countries in policy. We don't know enough about how to give a more effective voice to, uh, to the poor you know, um, in some of these economies. So let me end by, please, about how to work. And you've sort of heard some of that as, as I've gone through. Um, one is, researchers love talking about their own research. But when you're talking to policymakers, you have to put it in the context of it, the whole thing, right? Because we often hear people coming and pitching an individual study but that's not as effective in changing policy as the set of studies, the body of the work. This is what comes across from the body of work. And yes, I contributed to that body of work, but please, you know, don't just talk about your own research, <laughs> put it in the context of, uh, of everything else. Um, uh, because policymakers are appropriately skeptical of being told there's this one paper and you should do everything on the basis of that, right? That's an appropriate skepticism. Um, big overarching lessons, as I've said, it's about taking all of those individual studies and pulling out the real, the, the thing that is generalizable across. That's what, you know, that's what we as social scientists need to do is what is common to people across. Now, that is not saying that when you do your research, you don't have to worry about context and culture. Absolutely. It's that I talk about, you, you know, think locally, think really carefully about the local context, but then lift your eyes up and say what is common. What is common to people across all of these different contexts. And then when you want to take that lesson and apply it appropriately in a given country, you better worry about the local context again. But that doesn't mean that there isn't something that is the same for us as humans. Um, otherwise, why are we doing this research? Um, descriptive work. Often we do a lot of dis a lot of important descriptive work comes out of, you know, we collect a lot of data. I'm guilty of this myself. I've collected data on adolescent girls in Bangladesh from, you know, for the last 10 years. I will write a paper of which I will use, you know, 5% of that. But I have girls from, you know, 15 who are now in the labor force, have kids. I've tracked them. I know they're, you know, they're, uh, I've collected their height and weight and their work history and <laughs> their gender attitudes. That's a huge trove of descriptive data. And we need to do better at getting out that description because that's really valuable to, uh, to, to the world. Um, embedding. I'm really excited about the prospect of researchers being embedded within governments in developing countries. You have a huge opportunity when you do that to get a huge amount of data, you know, tax data. Um, uh, you know, we were hearing about in the UK the ability to link data, um, you know, uh, tax and earnings and education data, and you can learn a lot from that. We can start to do that in developing countries too now. Um, so you have access to data, but then you can also, as you're doing that, 
give back feedback to the government with the descriptive, you know, simply tabbing the data and doing some data visualization for them is incredibly helpful for them. And you know a lot about what the research says and, and can give a lot of advice. We as donors provide a lot of technical assistance, a lot of funding for technical assistance, which is often quite bad quality. Um, but it's really important. Like giving that advice to governments about how they can spend their money better is probably the most effective thing for development that we can do. Donor money is tiny compared to developing country government money. Right, so helping them spend their money better is absolutely vital. So as we work in these countries, giving back by giving feeding back advice is, is really important. And long-term relationships, I've found, are a really good way to do that. Um, and then just this final plea, um, because of you know, the discussion of this, uh, um, it, of this session about um, culture, culture and context being really important, is just, again, this, this idea to think about what is, when you're doing research, being really careful to understand the local context, but then also pulling out and being really clear about what you think are the general lessons that you think can apply across. And that's about designing, designing the research well in the first place to answer both locally contextual issues and these broader uh, general issues, um, while recognizing that if you ever want to take those lessons to a context, you've also got to think about implementation capacity. But let me just say, <laughs> If, you, if we as researchers say everything is about context, the policy world will take away from that, I can't learn anything from your papers about my context. And that's not what we think. We think there is a lesson. Let me give an, you know, an example about culture can change. What culture has changed and how it has <coughs> changed is going to be really different. But the general lesson that actually we have seen remarkable changes in some things that people have seen as fundamentally in, you know, deeply rooted cultural things. That is a common thing that we have found in many contexts. And so that's an example of the general lesson. So you know, if I think about, you know, you, you, there's your Rwanda example, but there's also the um, women, uh, the reservations for women in India you see in this period of five years, attitudes to women changing really dramatically. So it's, it's different things in different places. What you need to change is going to be different. But there's a, that general lesson that actually culture can be malleable is the, is the takeaway for me. Okay, thank you. Thank you.